Good afternoon and welcome to this week's episode of St. Paul's Soul Talk with Sean and Father Jay. Um, what do you know? We actually are doing it at noon. <laughs> this was the original intended time, though to be fair, quite often we end up coming a little bit later, once in a while earlier, but what do you know? We're here on this noon day together to discuss important issues facing the church, facing spirituality, and dare I say it, facing mankind, though we don't always come up with all of the solutions for it. Today's episode, we're going to be talking a little bit about roles in leadership, roles in people who are appointed to things where they're doing the best they can. And it's very easy sometimes when you're underneath to look up and be the uh, backseat driver or what, it, what is it I always say Monday morning quarterback, which I always get wrong because I'm not a sports person. But we're going to talk about positions that uh, Jay's had in his life where he's been a leader, where he made the best decision he thought at the time, but with the information he had and hindsight being 2020, maybe how he would have redone it or rethought it, and positions where I've been in leadership or when I've been working for leaders where I've questioned them and have had moments where I've wanted to say, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. But later, as I've gotten more information, I've said, no, I didn't have all the information and they were right in that context. So, and then later on, if we have some time, we're going to touch a little bit on an interview that Pope Francis had given last week to just talk about how he sees the church and its relation to young people for today. So, with that being said, let's get into it. I think that was me. The phone's buzzing all the time. Um, leadership's hard. Yes. Don't you think? <laughs> well, leadership is hard because unless you are so inclined to believe that you are always right, it causes tension. Mm -hmm. It causes a lot of tension. And unfortunately, in leadership positions, you have to make decisions now. You don't always have the luxury of putting it off, of talking to others, of seeing other things. If you can do some of that quickly, great. But sometimes a decision has to be made. Well, actually, it's so interesting because you you talked about having to make decisions quickly. And so often you have, you again, not having the luxury of talking to everybody, but I think sometimes it's you know something that you can't reveal. Well, there's often that case too. And that makes it very tricky to do something you know that you need to do and not being able to completely publicly support why. Mm -hmm. Because there are issues you just can't talk about. They may be personal. They may be private. They may affect people in a way that, yes, it affects what's going on, but you can't brand them by it. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I'm thinking of, of a specific incident in my leadership where I have to basically let somebody go. Mm -hmm. There were plenty of positives about this person. 
but there was something that unfortunately had been brought to my attention about the way they were supervising others and things that they were supposed to do that they didn't do. And so I had to take that into consideration and decide which was the more important issue. And, well, I did. I had to let the person go. And, you know, that caused a little bit of a ruckus. But I wasn't going to go into some of the details about it. Well, you can't in a lot of ways, Well, that's too. it. It, 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 it breached the privacy of other people. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't at liberty to do that. And yet I was called upon as, if you'll pardon the expression, the supreme leader, <laughs> the top dog, however you want to put it, that I had to make. And, you know, it's it's difficult to do that. You know, it's it's funny because, again, the leadership position, and I actually like that example, because so often I feel like leaders are looked at is a, well, can't you make everything good? Don't you feel, feel that that there's this problem? For your situation, this person was good at their job, but there were significant problems, and you had to weigh the blowback of, I made this decision to let this person go, now everybody who loved this person is mad, or do I keep this person and allow the tough behavior that is causing uh, an uncomfortableness. And the question is, which is worse? Well, that again comes down to be the problem. And I think, you know, it's important for us to remember, especially in the church, that in light of what has gone on in the past 20, 30 years, that we have had to adopt standards that are perhaps more draconian than we ever would have wished them to be. Mm -hmm. But because of what has happened, we cannot ignore what at some points, and even today, might be considered small infractions. And that's, that is the hard part. And I honestly believe uh, that someone in a position today, especially within the church, not exclusively within the church, but the church has been hit so hard by the sex scandal. I'm not going to get away from mentioning that. Yeah. But, uh, you know, that we've had to. We've had to have a zero tolerance policy. Well, and you see that sometimes, too. And... and Positive and negative, because since we're going to get into it, and I do think it's a, a, a part of leadership, don't you have those moments where, where you question, because your, your power in that specific area is nil. I mean, we, we've talked about things that have happened in the past, but your actual power as far as like diocesan downtown doesn't exist. But don't you have those moments, and I've seen it with people, where somebody is accused. And sometimes it is a false accusation, and when it's investigated and everything, you, you find it. But it's always... I always get very frustrated at false accusations because it cheapens the very real accusations. Anytime someone makes a false accusation, not only are they doing damage to a certain individual, they are also 
damaging anybody who was truly a victim by making a deniability factor happen. And, and I, I find that is so reprehensible. But I've seen with people, oh no, I know him. I know that accusation was made. He never, ever would have done that or she never would have done that. And then it comes out, of course they did because sometimes people are able to live that double life and, and hide that aspect of them. And then there are other times when people go, well, that's about right. I knew that. I thought that. I didn't like him anyway. And then it comes out that it was false. There was no real there. And that has to be really, really hard for anybody in authority to navigate bad actors. Well, and that is, that is a problem. And I think part of it is, and I'm going to, I have to go back to the example because, all right, this was a person who was under me but who had authority over others. And they had kind of ignored a minor instance. Could have been major, wasn't, but it was. But it kind of showed, you know, an under... An undermining of some of the things that the church has done to protect youth, to protect employees, mm -hmm. for total protection for everyone. And I said, had the potential to undermine. And so that's a judgment you have to weigh as a superior. Is this really enough? Should I let it go? Is it a pattern? Where do you come up with? Where do you not come from? Where do you make this decision from? Do you know what I find interesting? Very clearly, you're st you still are wrestling a little bit even today with, with where... Where it sounds with what was right, what was because it it's not easy. There's no playbook. No, there isn't a playbook. You have to go with what basically you feel is right from all of the information that you have at your disposal, and so you do have to have to do it. Okay. Well, do, you, do you know what? Because I actually said this to Jay before we started. One of Jay's and my favorite musicals is 1776. And it was funny because I told him as we're talking about leadership, I, I, I have something in my mind that I think I'm going to reference as we're talking about, but it, it's not the reference I told you Good. beforehand. What is... Um, interesting in it is there is a quote from the the delegate from Georgia, um, Dr. Lyman Hall, and he is very, very torn as John Adams is fighting for independence in it, and the way he phrased it to John Adams is the people of Georgia are very much against independence from Britain. And I am very much for it. And until I understand what being their representative means, I need time to figure it out. And eventually, as the whole rigmarole of the musical unfolds, he gets to a point where he says to John Adams that being a representative of the people, and he quotes a member of the British Parliament, is not only to give the people your agency, but it is to have the people trust in your judgment. And I think that's so relevant with leadership because when you are put into a leadership position, whether you may be making wrong decisions or right decisions, and you have that question in the wrestling in yourself, as the leader, 
you are trusted with your judgment for True. better or worse. And that is an immense amount of pressure <laughs> to, to be quite fair. True. True. And just to kind of go back on what Sean just said, that's his eventual answer. That is not his first answer. Mm -hmm. Lyman Hall's first answer is, until I figure this out, I'll have to side with the people. Yes. But he kept an open mind. And I think that's what all leaders have to do. They have to keep an open mind because he wasn't, when it starts out, he comes into the Congress, the Continental Congress, having looked for it for days <laughs> yes. as a new delegate, <laughs> and he swarmed by both sides of the argument yep. to make a statement right then and there. And he says, my convictions are personal. <laughs> and I know basically, you know, again, that goes back to what I said earlier about the fact that sometimes we do not have that luxury of time mm -hmm. that a decision needs to be made and we have to do it with the best possible information facts that we are aware of well and one of my reasons for bringing this up and i'll, I'll go and give it an example later in my life of the opposite side um but one of my reasons to bring this up is we have a habit, I think, sometimes of dehumanizing our leaders, particularly when they do something that we don't like, but also when they do stuff we like. We either are putting them on the pedestal as they're the greatest ever known to man. No one could be a leader as, as wonderful or great as this, or in instances of doing things we disagree with, they're horrible. They're rotten. They're the worst human being ever. They are deliberately mean. They're deliberately uh, backstabbing, conniving, and we come up with everything. When the truth of the matter is we don't see all angles, and we're going to be honest, the church is at an inflection point, particularly our church of the Diocese of Buffalo. Well, we, the wider church is too, because the world is at an inflection point. But our microcosm is one that we are dealing with, and let's be honest, we should focus on our corner of the world because we can't absorb the world's problems. With dealing with our own inflection point, having that patience for our leaders, reminding ourselves that they are human, I mean, not to bring up fully bad stuff, but you have talked about it, closing the school. You couldn't reveal every, every angle that had been talked about. And you said now that years have passed, you can talk a little bit about the discussions you had with downtown in an attempt to save the school, but you can't re couldn't reveal all of it. And you've said, and I... We're not beating around the bush. There was a lot of anger and a lot of hurt. But you were a human doing the best you could with the situation that was in front of you. And, and that's true. And, you know, I really don't want to backtrack to something that happened, what, 13 years ago? 14 years ago. <laughs> it was a year or two before I met Sean, to be quite yeah. honest with you. And that, however, was a decision I had to make, which in the end affected, in a negative way, the entire parish. But again, as a leader, it was something that I had to do. And, you know, talk as I would, reason as I would, the people who were so pro-school 
could not accept or understand the fact that, you know, it wasn't what it had been. Mm -hmm. The school wasn't what it had been. Catholic education and the support for Catholic education wasn't what it had been. Well, and you were dealing with, as you said in one of our conversations, the charter school aspect, which was also fairly at the time. I think the first one was two thousand and three. It was. It was. Know. It wasn't that <clears throat> that much prior to the school closing. I, I, I believe it was early. I, I think the whole point was that you know. As a church, we had had this tradition of Catholic parish schools. And that was a hard tradition to buck. Especially since, you know, obviously most of you who were there know I'm talking about St. Paul's. And St. Paul's School, which I did close. And, you know, I was talking about closing a school that had been there for 111 years. 111 years that parish had had that school in one form or another. And it was a difficult choice. Anybody who knows me knows what a respecter of history I am. <laughs> yes, and, very much. And, you know... And anybody who really knows me knows that I was a very strong supporter of Catholic schools. And yet I was made out to be the exact opposite. That I had been sent there to close the school. If, if you want to put it another way, I was an agent of Satan. <laughs> Not really, but, you know, <laughs> kind of in that vein, yeah. I'm speaking. At any rate, it was a decision which was made upon a number of facts. Facts that people didn't want to deny. And a fact that, all right, something had been suggested a few years before, which was totally misconstrued by me. Mm -hmm. By me. It was a proposition about funding for the school. Unfortunately, as it was presented to me, it was presented for, for our youth. I took that in a different sense than school. And so I handed it over to somebody who was in charge of youth. In general. Right. To look into, to see, whatever. Only later did it come back to me as being for the school. And unfortunately, things had gone too far. And I, I, I regret that, because that might have made a difference. Because, let's face it, we all know the Catholic schools, even elementary schools, have become very expensive. And it's difficult for parents having to make a choice, looking at their budgets, to send their children, and especially if they have two or three of them, to a Catholic school when the current range of cost for it, there are still some that are below five. Not many. Not many, mind you. There are still some that are below 5000 a year. But there are more now that are beginning to top six or seven, which 10 years ago, that was considered the price of the high school. 10 years ago, six or seven was the high school price, now the elementary schools. Right. And But the whole point was that I was making was that they had to look at it and say, according to their budget, well, 
It doesn't cost me anything to send them to the public school. Mm -hmm. And, oh, they pay taxes. This, they're paying the taxes whether you send your kid there or not. Mm -hmm. So it's no additional cost to you. And they have to make sometimes a decision they don't like to make. But, you know, that affects enrollment, affects effectiveness, it affects socialization, except it, it affects classroom dynamics. Well, and a very real thing that nobody always likes to talk about from the Catholic school side of it, there aren't, there aren't none teachers or priest teachers, I mean, for the most part, or order teachers, right. where you're looking at lay teachers who need homes, need, need to be able to afford to live as well. I was looking, um, because I, being head of the union at St. Mary's, I have the history of the pay scale. Full-time, Teacher, 94, 1994, master's degree, $9,100 a year. Which again, you know, it's almost 30 years ago, but, but still, when you, it, having a home on that, having the ability to live, to support a family, buy groceries, et cetera, et cetera. You, you, you get the picture. And I think, you know, and it was, it's much above that now. Mm -hmm. Yes, very much. It is much above that now. But, to be quite honest, it's still difficult. Nowhere does a Catholic school teacher's salary approach that of a public school teacher. And there's a difference there. Yes, is there a level of dedication? Yes, is there this, that, the other thing? However, and they are wonderful, wonderful teachers, but a lot of them make a sacrifice to teach right. in that position. And that's the truth. But again, just getting to the decision to close the school you know, which maybe not many people know. You know, once I had made the choice in my own head, having weighed all of the factors, having discussed with the diocese, including the bishop by this point, and, you know, I actually had a total night of nausea. Mm -hmm. I spent most of that night in the bathroom. I felt that horrible. But I couldn't see a way around it. And people downtown at the diocese, including the bishop, patted me on the back and said, you know, we're behind you. We know you have to do it. It's not going to be easy. Then I was also told, well, you can talk to the press if you want to, <laughs> but I would suggest you let everything go through the diocesan spokesman. I took advice from those elders, so to speak. Well, to be fair, the press, no matter how you would have handled it, the press is never the best place. No, it isn't. But the fact that I was hiding from mm -hmm. the press did not improve anything. Okay, those were decisions I made, all wrapped around the closing of the school. Some of them were good, some of them were bad. Some were right and some were wrong. At any rate, it happened, and I have suffered the consequences of it, of a decision I made as a leader. Okay? Um, and 
and unfortunately, um, I've been branded as don't go anywhere near a parish that has a school. Which, and I know we can beat this until the cows come home, is a shame because I think you're very, very good with, with that age. It's kind of funny because you and I have this in common when you're, we're forced to be social. You and I do a very, very good job of it. But given a vacuum, we would choose to go home and lock the door and be by ourselves. But that's the aspect of being shy. And to lighten it up before we do talk a little bit about the Pope, I just also want to talk from the other perspective of following a leader. Because there's, there's times where... Sometimes you think in the position where you're underneath a leader, you can see things so much more clearly than the leader. And sometimes that's true. I'm not going to beat around the bush. Sometimes you do because you can notice the little things that they may not see having to have the bird's eye view. But you also have to realize there's a different perspective. And this is a much smaller one, but I remember I had a principal years and years ago, this is probably seven years ago, at this point, and I, I loved her. She's actually one of my favorite people, and I've had I've been so blessed to have really, really good principals that I've worked with as a teacher. But there was a little bit of tension at a middle school level, and there is tension now in education. Period, and I. I really wasn't meant to be a whole video on ed leadership and education, but I think it does carry over to diocesan leadership. But one aspect is that education, as you get to middle school, because of these, has gotten so much harder because kids have phones, they can talk to each other, they can text each other, they can do all of these things where there's a lot more tension amongst kids. And at this particular time, each teacher in the school had their own leadership style, how they ran their classroom. And it was driving many, many teachers insane. And I remember talking to the principal saying, you need, as a principal, as our leader, to say, this is our discipline policy, this is how it's handled, this, 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 they do this, this is the exact consequence, period. Because not every teacher can be on the same page. You need to be the leader and tell us what to do. It's been, as I said, seven years. And her response to me made me upset and, and very frustrated. And yet at this juncture in my life, I think she was right. What she said was, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that because it's a disservice to the students and their learning. And at first I was like, oh my gosh, why don't you see it my way? My way would fix it. And I was so frustrated and with a person that I do adore. And, and Jay can testify mm -hmm. that I, I have nothing but deep admiration for her. That I was so frustrated because I saw, I thought I was seeing a need when she wasn't meeting it. And she went on and I disagreed with her with how she said it because she said, as someone is learning, as a child, as a teenager, as a young adult, you are going to have to realize in your life there are places where there are different expectations. You're expected Say you're going to Shays, where it's all fancy and it's a black tie event. You're expected to dress this way. You're expected to speak a certain way. Say you're with your friends and um, tongue-in-cheek. You, you all are used to crass jokes. That's expected. That field, you're expected. Then you're amongst your friend's parents. You're expected to 
they do things as respect. And she said it is a lesson that they have to learn to learn how to adjust to the expectations of the place they were in. Now, at the time, seven years ago, it was like, they are too young to have that on them. You need to be too much stronger. As an adult, I mean, I was an adult then, but as an older, wiser, or at least I'd like to believe wiser, adult, I look back. More experienced. On, more experienced. I look back and say, no, that, that was probably the right course of action. Because you did need that. She saw something that I didn't. Well, and I think what you're saying in one respect is she saw education from a wider perspective mm -hmm. than just math or social studies or whatever. She saw education as a whole building the future of, of children. Yes. Growth in them. And and to be 100% frank, knowing her as well as I do, that's what she would absolutely say. That it's more about teaching you how to function and be a human being. Yes, the math is important, the science is important, social studies, all of it's important, but a lot of it you will adapt to and learn what you need to survive if you can learn how to be a person a human being. And and that's one of the aspects of Catholic education, just as a sidebar, because I know we want to wrap up in about 10 minutes. But one of the sidebars is that's what I find so important about Catholic education. And this ties even into our last couple of episodes of thinking of a value system. And I go to my grandmother who, who taught in Buffalo her entire life. And she was superintendent of curriculum, and right when she retired, they switched to scripted lessons where they said if you deviated from the script, you could get in trouble. Now, I love my grandmother. I don't know if that's an over-exaggeration of a real part, or, but she would talk about how you can't spend time talking about feelings, talking about values, talking about how to follow morals. And and I'm not saying morals that are just ingrained in the Catholic Church, but just morally being able to respect and look at each other. You don't have as much time. And in the Catholic Church, the Catholic schools, even our students who are not Catholic are able to talk about the idea of morality, the idea of values, the idea of serving others as a lifelong mission. Serving others as a lifelong mission. I think that's one of the biggest and most important parts of Catholic schools because the kids are allowed to say, let's fundraise for this person. Let's find these families who are in need. Let's spend time working for them to mm -hmm. serve others. And I think that's something that, while we get maybe a little in the public school, and having grown up in a public school, I can tell you we get a little of it. It's not like at the Catholic school where every month you're doing something as a mission for those around you. I think having spent my entire schoolhood in Catholic schools, mm -hmm. from kindergarten through graduate school, I do not have that experience at all because I only have the Catholic school experience. Yes. And so I can't speak of that. But... You know, I do see what Sean is getting at. And I do know, because I do read, I do, in my own way, research. Well, not formal, but research. Mm -hmm. and, and, and see where, you know, the public schools are driven by success rates. Yeah. Math, reading, particularly. Yes. Those two areas. Those are the statistics you see in the paper. How they compare school districts. How they compare teachers. And how they compare the teachers' abilities. I'll just leave it at that. Yes. Because I could go on saying a lot. We, we, we all absolutely could. So switching to... I read a very interesting um, interview... 
with Pope Francis, and we don't we only have a couple of those, but it was just it was fascinating because I want to tie it into a hobbly that Jay gave at St. Christopher's recently, but um, he was traveling as as the Pope often does, and it's a still with the clip he's going, it's hard to believe that he's eighty six. You know, um, and while he may have mobility issues, the mind is still there. But somebody made an accusation towards him in the press because he cut a lot of his homily shorter as he was traveling and preaching. And somebody said, well, is it that you've aged too much? And they, they accused him. He said, no, my mind is perfectly there. Well, is it you couldn't do this, couldn't do that? He said, I am feeling good. I am feeling good and much better. But I have come to the conclusion that no one wants to be lectured to in a homily, and nobody wants me to be overly wordy. And the Pope himself said in Spanish, though I don't know what the Spanish is, haven't you ever sat through a homily that's just pure torture? I don't know the Spanish or Portuguese because well, it was yes, a world youth day in Portugal. But. That's true. But it was um but it was interesting because I think each person has a thing they respond to in homilies differently. But I bring it up a little bit because Jake had this wonderful, wonderful intro <laughs> to his homily about I think three weeks ago. About that, yeah. And I, you can say it because you said it better than I did. Well, I started out by asking, basically, how many of you would be happy if I didn't preach today? <laughs> Just raise your hands. And of course, no one raised their hand. And you did say, come on, be honest. I did. I added that to it. Come on, be honest. And, and I'm told that they were a couple people, kind of, but didn't put it up. <laughs> At any rate. And then I went on to say, and this is why I don't trust polls. <laughs> but it's interesting because I think there is some what a point in it, and I've always been able to follow yours, but that, that idea of trying to get the message out in a concise way, um, and it's tough because sometimes you want to relay information, you want, which is why I like this, because we do a longer format of, you know, 45 minutes, but we can say, okay, if, if you're too tired or you can watch a segment, watch a little segment of it, come back for the rest later, you don't have to sit in a 45-minute period watching right. a talk show without commercials. Sorry, no one's sponsoring us yet. Get on that. <laughs> Tongue firmly in cheek. But when it's in church, I think it is a, a, doing a homily that can capture all of those people's attention. I only had to preach twice, not online, because I've done yes. this form of it online, but preach twice at when I worked for the Lutherans. The pastor wasn't there and nobody else had stood up to do it. And I remember going, this is the most painful experience of my life, because I looked at everybody's facial expression and every little twitch they had, I was like, oh gosh, that they hate me, they hate me, they hate me, they don't like what I'm saying, they want to run me out of this building. And I don't envy you guys having to do that. You know, what can I say? I've been preaching for 48 years. 48 years formally from the time I was ordained a deacon. And I must admit, uh, the two summers before that, I worked at the diocesan boys camp, Camp Turner, which was in Allegheny State Park. And those of us who were seminarians, which I was, uh, were offered the opportunity, uh, actually were asked to preach at um, uh, some of the Sunday Masses. Mm -hmm. Because it wasn't only the kids, 
but the campers as well from around the area of Quaker Lake who come in for the masses on Sunday. And so I did. And so that means that, you know, basically, I've been doing it for 49 years. And boy, am I a lot different than what I was back then. But not completely. And I think one of the things that I think is most important for us to remember as Catholics is the whole idea that we changed. We changed the name from a sermon to a homily. And that may not seem like much, the, the change in name, but it was the whole idea of we're not sermonizing at you. We're not sermonizing at you. We're trying to break open the word of God for you. We're trying to present to you the sum of what the message of Christ is here. You know, actually, could you speak to that? Because I've never even really known the difference. Because when, having worked with Protestants over the years, their, their homily, their sermon class, rather, is called homiletics. Right. But I even, for all the years that I've been involved, I never really, I just thought it was a, a semantic difference. I didn't even realize well, there it's, was. It's, it's, it is something of a semantic difference. Yes, it is homiletics. Mm -hmm. Sermons, homiletics, it's always been called homiletics. And that comes from, you know, a whole history of, you know, wording and changing in words and whatever else through time and different languages. But I think the intent was kind of to change the focus. Okay. To change the focus from here am I, the all-knowing, the all-wise preacher imposing on you mm -hmm. the idea of breaking open the Word of God and sharing it with you. I think, it, and going with what we had started, and we'll wrap up because there's other par parts of what Pope Francis said, but we have weeks to do this. <laughs> and, and, and we will be here as long as you tolerate us. Um, that ties completely in with what he said. In the, it's... People don't want to be just lectured at. No. They don't need to need to sit here and say, well, the, and it's, the grand irony is, I love the historical context. I know not a lot of people do, and I can acknowledge what, what works for me doesn't always work for the masses sometimes, but I could listen to a homily where they would go and say, well, when it was written in the original Greek and it was translated from this, I love that stuff. I know that doesn't necessarily grab a lot of people's attention. I'm way more of a history buff than a lot of people. But that idea of I'm just spitting information at you as opposed to more of um, advice, helping explain, how do you incorporate into your life? Tools, maybe. I, I don't know the right necessary word. You know, I wouldn't say incorporating, uh, but yeah, incorporating into your life, yes. I'm not sure as tools, because I've found the tools are different for every person. Yes. And for me to get up say, and say, this is the tool, or when someone asks me, well, how do I? And, you know, I'm always at a loss because they're expecting me to give them a direct answer. And what I usually try to say is, it's different for every person. You have to try various things and find out what works for you. But just getting back to what Sean had mentioned, you know, he, the history buff, he loves history. I have a BA in history. I mean, you know, that's what I graduated from college with. And believe me, I love history. And I find that incorporating some of those facts that he just mentioned into a homily is all right. 
as long as you don't dwell on them as the be all and end mm -hmm. all. If you bring them into a focus to share some ideas about what's going on or what the original scripture may have meant to the early Christians that might be a little bit different from what we experience today. And I found that over the years, people have thanked me for doing that and presenting them with something that they never knew well, you, about the church, about scripture, etc. You know the one that I feel that I always hearken back to for that specific one is the Good Samaritan. Because we, in our today view of looking at the Good Samaritan, we absolutely understand the Samaritan's the good guy. That's that's the most common. We're supposed to look at the judge and um, the, the Levite the Levite as the bad guys or, or the ones not doing it. And I remember once being explained from a ritualistic standpoint, the body prop, the the person who was beaten probably looked dead, and the other ones couldn't have touched it according to Jewish law. Or that there was blood. And that there was blood. There was there were reasons. And the people of Christ's time would not would have actually not necessarily looked at the Samaritan being the I think the, 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 the what's the well, at the outset, lower class. At the outset, basically they would look at the judge, the priest, and the Levite as being the good guys. Mm -hmm. And at the outset, the Samaritan was the bad guy because they were separate people. They were of half Jewish descent, but they were different. They different. They followed the law differently. They only accepted the Hebrew scripture up to the Torah. Mm -hmm. The Torah was all that there was. And they didn't accept the prophets and any of the other books that we find in what we call the Old Testament. So they were separate from the Jewish people. And the two had a very distinct dislike for one another, especially the Jews who looked down upon the Samaritans. But in going with the history aspect, and we'll wrap up, and again, thank you all for with it, I think it's so important to know that when you hear that story. Because in our modern day, we hear it, and our initial reaction is, well, no, duh. Of, of course, the Samar no one could argue anybody else was doing the right thing here. Right. Samaritan, 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 to the point where the good Samaritan is literally enshrined in our laws of protecting somebody who may do something wrong while trying to help someone else. Right. That is, it, there are good Samaritan laws for people who call, call the police when someone's suffering or an ambulance when somebody's suffering. And if they did something and they made a false call, but their intent and their belief was that they were helping, they are protected by, and quote, good Samaritan laws. It's become such a positive term. Oh, you, you were just a good Samaritan helping people. And a Samaritan would have been insult at the time of Christ. And I think that changes and makes the story so much richer. When you know that context of what Jesus was saying, that Christ was saying, extolling the virtues of a people that were widely considered not virtuous. Yeah, I think basically what he was doing was attempting to flip the values from ritualism to acting for the good of others. Mm -hmm. And on that note, because we could go forever, I thank you for joining us today. Um, this will go out in the newsletter. Tonight we are having a special uh, praise and worship night based on healing with our pastor, Father Michael Parker, and then Jay and I will be having our next one sometime in September, most likely with different aways and, and stuff. Uh, next week, we may not be live on Tuesday. There's a couple of uh, events that I have to do. I forgot to tell you about, but 
okay. we'll get to it. Uh, but we'll probably be looking at a different day. Um, it just means that in the newsletter, you'll get a previous week's um, probably uh, our discussion about the renewal pillars and each specific one, because I know that some of you have actually asked us specifically to talk about that. So we'll be sending that out with a little bit more detail. So we hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, we bless you uh, and, and thank you for tolerating us. <laughs> yes, thank you. And I know I talked a little bit much when we were supposed to be quitting, so we're going way over time. But thank you so much. Have a wonderful week. Uh, we just didn't have Liz here to crack the whip. <laughs> bless you all.